So um, normally this talk is called uh, Crash Course with Bastion, but I want to call it Let It Crash Course with Bastion. And you might have known this, what is this wording coming from? And we are going to talk about this wording and uh, ongoing slides. So um, let's uh, talk about what I'm, who I am. Let me introduce myself. So I'm doing data processing by day. Uh, I'm writing uh, Rust since 0 0.4, and uh, I wrote a couple of the uh, compiler stuff inside. And uh, currently, I have a couple of open pull requests to the MIRI, and uh, uh, we are unleashing the MIRI right now. And um, some other uh, Rust projects uh, I'm working on. Uh, I'm a member of the community, team, and uh, that is all I can say, <laughs> I think. And uh, let's start. And by the way, with this, you can see that my drawings are really not good. And um, let's talk about how people communicate. So we communicate uh, asynchronously. So what we are doing is basically um, exchanging messages and um, saying uh, things to uh, each other. And then there is no actually uh, something that is blocking us, right? I mean, this is how uh, our life and communication works. And I think, I believe that the software system should be like the, how the nature, it, nature is. So if you have a, if, if um, you don't see any um, blocking in the nature and uh, you, everything is basically um, kind of working like a message passing and there's a wind blowing, there's, everything is working like that. And uh, when it comes to the com uh, communication over shared memory, I think it is not natural. And so let, let's think about a um, case that is like, we don't write to a paper on the desk and then we just don't read from there, right? To communicate with each other, with you, for example. And um, I'm telling some words, you're hearing and you can reply back and this is how it is working. And uh, like every single time, failures and faults are natural. So we can, we can get sick and then uh, basically um, we need to recover from that, right? To continue our lives. So this is how uh, people are communicating and how the uh, nature works. But let's talk about the Rust right now. Uh, how Rust does this error handling, we just, I, I think, and it's purely subjective, uh, we don't do much when we say error handling. We have some error typing, but not purely error handling. Um, we write a lot of code to determine the control flow in case of errors. And um, basically, um, this is like, um, if this error kind happens, do that. And if, if this one happens, do yet another thing, like A, B. And what you see in here is basically that this is like uh, from the trait, like how other, uh, other uh, error structs actually uh, assembled and based on the error kinds, what we are defining what are we going to do. And we have some, as you can see in the yellow parts, that we don't have actually things uh, defined. Or maybe we are ignoring these. Or maybe we don't want to handle these. And uh, this is just a one use case. And inside, um, you can see that you are basically propagating everything one by one. And you're handling. And you need to write these things to actually recover from the her errors, OK? So this is basically, in, in this example, this is basically a response error coming from the Redis client. And it's basically uh, propagated to your error type, with, let's say, with the error chain crate. And this is basically how you are doing the um, error handling. When we are doing this uh, error handling, let's say, uh, we are sacrificing the availability. And we, uh, we also sacrifice the asynchrony. And we don't ta uh, take action on errors. Uh, we always use try or question mark, you know, and uh, this creates this uh, long uh, error chains, and um, which is also creating long recovery codes, in my opinion. And it's hard to maintain it, when uh, the project gets bigger. It's hard to maintain, I would say. So this is the things that we need to fix actually this year. So you, if you are actually inside the Rust community, and if you are uh, watching how, which kind of things are happening, probably you saw the talks about the uh, error handling. So 
but today I'm going to talk about the not the error handling that we are going to talk about. It's going to be more like uh, uh, how Erlang Dance does. So um, it's kind of different than the uh, Rust Rust's own uh, error handling code. So let's enter to the dependable systems. So obviously we need to talk about the dependable systems because uh, if you're familiar with the uh, electronics and stuff and embedded systems, uh, dependable systems probably you heard. And uh, we need to know first uh, how errors and faults and failures are propagating. So we need to talk about the dependable systems. And this is like how it is inside the embedded systems. We should also know about the uh, uh, dependable systems to re uh, reflect this to the normal uh, services that we are writing, like the, for serving to the customers and stuff like that. So let's come to the point. First, error handling is not fault recovery. So we have this beach, uh, kind of problem that everybody is actually thinking about and actually uh, this is co completely wrong and it's actually the first thing is actually is told in the classes and also in the uh, books of the dependable systems. This is the thing. Um, and we need to know about the failures then. If error handling is not a fault recovery, we need to know how faults and how, what is error and what is failure. So this is how fault, error, failure is actually uh, propagated inside the all software systems. Normally, what uh, we, as uh, the software engineering part in the upper layer of the abstraction, we don't see it like this. This is coming from the embedded systems. Let's take a look. So in the lower level of the system, you see a fault. There's a fault happening. It's dormant, it's staying in there, and then it transforms, in, uh, transforms into an error. When you detect an error, the t first thing, that what error handling is, that gathering information about the error, okay? So that is error handling. Detecting and gathering information, that is the, all the part of the error handling. Rest of the uh, part is that what you're doing is a fault recovery. So then you have a fa failure, and then failure propagates to the upper layer as a fault. And then fault it does this recursive thing until the layers are actually at the surface of the program, okay? When you're at the surface of the program, that failure, the last failure that you see in there, is basically become a hazard. And then what, you are, uh, what happens is that your program crashes. So what uh, is basically uh, all these uh, orchestration tools are there just because to prevent you from the hazards. So the, all the hazards are uh, basically uh, happening from this kind of chaining. So, so we know right now what, what is the fault, what is the failure, and uh, how is propagated. So what we need to do in the Rust environment, and maybe in the most of our software engineering part, so we, we, have, uh, we need to separate the business logic and this error recovery. When I say error recovery, it's fault recovery, my, my word. So uh, we, we need to clearly separate two, uh, these two the things. Unfortunately, in my uh, subjective opinion, we don't do this inside Rust. So what we have is that every single time you have some kind of result, and you need to actually wrap these results, error kind, and errors inside the results, and these results are in, uh, wrapped inside the results again, and then you need to unwrap in the correct place or expect something, right? This is the problematic part of it. And it's going to be a problematic part of it because you are writing these things inside of the I.O. operations or the things that has the side effects. And these side effects are actually having some problems. And uh, you are writing this in, around the code that your business logic is, where your business logic is. So we need to first clearly separate the business logic and the error recovery. This is the first part that we need to do. Second. Yes, so when everybody uh, comes here, this talk, uh, this uh, meetup and stuff like that, probably and every single time we are talking about asynchrony. There is asynchrony. Nowadays, the systems are co uh, completely co uh, concurrent and they, they should be concurrent, right? So this is the part that should be also separate in a mind that how the design, it, the design of them. So design of the asynchrony should be in parallel to business logic, but also uh, be logical and be separate. And uh, now let's separate the error handling and fault recovery here. 
error handling, like I've said, the gathering information and uh, aggregating this information to the place that is going to do the fault recovery. So we have these four stages, right? So right now, that is what we have done for last seven months to, uh, to create this project. So the bastion is basically what it is to uh, handle all these things for you, to help you to uh, actually create asynchronous error, uh, gathering uh, information about the errors, kind of uh, runtime, and separate your business logic from that, and the fault recovery is built in inside. So this is what the uh, bastion is. So um, right now, um, this is what I can say about the bastion. And it, first thing that I really want to uh, talk about is that it's not an actor framework. Everybody is asking you on the Reddit, it's not an actor framework. No, no, damn no. And uh, basically what it is that how I can say that you heard Erlang probably. Erlang is, ha has some kind of lightweight processes, right? So we have replicating inside the bastion is the lightweight processes. And then on top of it, we, we built uh, this executor. So the executor is basically uh, taking this lightweight processes and uh, applying their life cycles at that level. And the upper layers, I am going to show you about the callbacks and how these th kind of uh, helpful things in the bastion will help you. Um, so, everything is good, right? Right? I mean, you want to have it all? Yes, everybody wants to have it all, I think. And I'm saying use bastion. So, how bastion recovers errors? Through the supervisors. So, you, I don't know how many people heard the supervisors. Did you hear supervisors? What, is, what are supervisors? Cool, two people, okay. So, but no problem, no problem. I'm going to talk about this. So supervisors are the things that, is, that are actually encapsulating your actual, uh, how can I say, managing that actual code that you are writing with the, thing, with the um, uh, rules that you are defining. So let's say you have, a, you have a web server, let's say tens of web servers opened up to the 10 ports. And uh, you have one supervisor that is actually saying that um, restart uh, one by one. So if one of the uh, servers fail, in that case, that uh, supervisor is the manage manager of these uh, worker processes. It, and it, what it does is that, yeah, I'm going to uh, restart that one server that is in the port thousand something and lead, let's say. And then it just restarts that uh, uh, worker process. This is, for example, one for one supervision strategy. And there are some other supervision strategies that will help you that you can completely restart your application while your application is running, when an error occurred, and then your application will continue uh, working. There will be no problems. So this is very, very basic syntax of how the bastion is. And uh, as you can see that, um, you just need to initialize, give a supervisor, and you don't need to give a supervisor too. There's a built-in supervisor that will do all the things for you too. You, if you don't know, you can learn by time. What is the supervisors? What are, what are the things uh, called children? And what are, uh, you, what are they used for? We have written a um, very uh, extensive documentation about this. And um, this part, supervi supervisors and the uh, the restarting strategies are helping you to uh, contain the business logic, also uh, do the fault, uh, fault recovery for you. So uh, one more thing that will help you uh, do, uh, in case of faults. For example, this is a simple function that is called the SP, but it's basically creating a supervisor. So inside the supervisor, you can have callbacks. So through the callbacks, you can define the life cycles of the lightweight processes. So who used Akka? Cool. You know in Akka there are pre-start, pre-stop, and uh, things like uh, post-stop, post-start, and all the things like the Akka life cycle, right? So it is in here exactly the same. These callbacks are the life cycles, but in, for all the individual children. But in addition to the ACAS or the, any actor frameworks architecture, these life cycles are basically um, also be replicated across the uh, 
span of uh, children. So we have a children group that can go up to 1000 uh, processes and you can still have these callbacks inside all these processes. So you can uh, gracefully shut down after the stop and gracefully connect back to the, some other uh, database and stuff like that back again. And uh, you can generate children. You can give the uh, strategy again, and you can give the callbacks, and you can create a supervision tree under it. So basically, you are creating a tree of uh, things that can be managed themselves, which has built-in fault tolerance and error handling. Boom. That is what I can say. So, I mean, some, some, uh, Esteban wrote this. I will not do it. I'm grabbing the production. I'm, I'm, no, no. I mean, and then Pascal wrote something like, yeah, I added restart always. Yeah, system D. Oh, God, come on. I mean, don't need to do that. I mean, we are saying that dance on production with us. So just restart. I mean, it is going to restart anyway. The only the process that you need. It is going to be restarted. Your database, if your database connection didn't fail, it is not going to restart the database connection you have inside the um, asynchronous code. So th there is no problem in, uh, here. So you can just use this, and basically it. So what Bastion brings is this supervision hierarchy that I told you, and uh, this complete system of it, and this natural asynchronous communication. And I will come to this natural part that will also might hurt the minds, like, because it's like subjective opinion again. So, and it uh, comes with the resiliency. So this, uh, this is like the uh, part that is the fault tolerance brings, so the, it should be resilient. And uh, they might, uh, your workers or the things that is working in the background should, uh, can fail, but it should, be, it should recover that. So this is the one of the things that I think that is important because everything is failing and we don't need to write some extra things if we can handle things by ourselves, okay? And the thing that I show you with this cross of things that asynchronous called business logic, the separation of concerns, you already know that. So that we need to separate these concerns. So this bastion allows you to separate all these concerns. And it eliminates the need of the wrapping your result type. So everybody's right now, this error handling um, talks are happening in the Rust community and then everybody is talking about the wrapping the result types and uh, we need to eliminate this, and this actually eliminates, eliminates this in a sense, because you can just unwrap in that place if you have enough code, enough um, data to unwrap, the information to unwrap. So you don't need to do this. Uh, you don't need to write the uh, chains and stuff like that if you don't want to alter the error that is coming up to you. And uh, you don't need to carry these uh, dynamical errors. This, you know, if you if you are in the Rust community, quite with a while. Uh, this is a pain in the pita moment of everything. Uh, eliminate the need of ca uh, carrying these. So it's like a, with the dynamic dispatch and all these things, so is there are uh, errors that can be shared between the threads and sent between, among the threads and stuff like that. So this is the problematic part that we are having right now. And I think the, uh, this also allows us to uh, fix this thing. And as you can see, this is a completely different approach to the error handling because I, uh, we didn't actually use anything like the error chain create, create tool. We don't use anything to, uh, that is actually doing these kind of things. You just write expect and if it fails, the, the information that you were expecting is going to be inside. So, and um, we are <coughs> working right now to, um, improve the uh, information gathering part. And, uh, and we also think that the writing resilient systems shouldn't be hard. So that is the thing. And uh, let's talk a little bit about the supervision hierarchy. So we have a system at the top of everything. This is a um, process um, that is actually running and uh, let's, let's call it process. And uh, it's not a process in the STD or something like that. It's just a process. Uh, it's like the replication of stackless coroutines that what we have this in a second weight. And uh, we have two separate things inside the system at the supervision hi hierarchy. 
left side is the user. So uh, what you are creating with using the bastion is that the left side is purple area that you, uh, is you. And the uh, right side is like when you include a library or something like the um, system is going to do something about it. So uh, in the next stages of the development, we are going to write something very close to the Erlang's observer that you can observe the processes. So the observer will be uh, placed under the system. So it's basically uh, the systems that user shouldn't see and also con makes uh, things continue to operate is falling under the system. Uh, and uh, all the user code is falling under the left hand side. So this is how it is. And we have order of signalization. So every signal that is, when we say signal, like the shutdown messages and broadcast. So the, uh, Bastion also broadcasts to the whole tree. So if you give the uh, tree uh, node, it is going to uh, broadcast all the messages uh, to the, all the children, under that children, all the supervisors, all the children's supervisors and stuff like that. Under that, you can have a full communication, but there, there's uh, the order of shutdown and broadcast goes over there, goes over the system. So actually the system is kind of the manager of everything and then basically uh, does uh, most of the life cycle stuff. And you, can, you are writing the callbacks and stuff like that, but the life cycle is managed by the system. We are, we are just parsing these things, using these life cycle methods uh, as a dynamic uh, uh, functions and then we are just uh, executing them in the correct place. The callbacks are how callbacks are executed is exactly like this. So let's come to the unnatural asynchrony, the natural and unnatural asynchrony difference. So we have a problem in the Rust. We shouldn't need the same return type for all features. For example, if you are going to race them, we call it race and I think that it is wrong. But it is not racing in a sense. It is just, yeah, it is racing, but it is like working in a different way, I would say. And we shouldn't need the same return type for all the features. And we shouldn't need to fuse this at all to actually say that the signal back to the completion. So we are always signal back to the completion and, uh, hey, are you done? Yes, I am done, because I am none. This is not how things should be working with fuse. And uh, it shouldn't be like that. And to be honest, Streams API shouldn't have handed out elements and we should have asked for the elements. So we are pushing down the demand. So we, this is how we are doing, like pushing down the demand. When we in, initialize something in Rust, uh, in basically in streams and the futures nowadays, we are pushing down the demand from up to down, but it's how it, how it shouldn't be. And, uh, and obviously this makes the back pressure, if you know the burning, uh, is not natural. So it's like very unnatural. And uh, there are problems like this. That's actually, um, from my point, uh, makes life a little bit harder. So um, this is just a stale copy of the futures uh, uh, documentation. And um, I think that this is uh, kind of uh, wrong. Uh, and it shouldn't be like that because in most of the other languages, it's not like that. So um, we need to learn about, uh, a lot of things from the other languages maybe. And um, let's come to the natural asynchrony. Yeah, this code is so much indented. My friend told me that, you, please un unindent this thing. And I'm too lazy to do that, sorry. And, um, but I need to show a couple of things here. So this is just a worker in, in, instantiation. You can put everything inside of uh, functions and uh, you don't need to do these things uh, inside. And, um, it can be flat, uh, not nested like this. And uh, it's basically, we create the redundancy. So I said that the, we replicate the children and then we create a redundancy. So what you are passing inside, the closure is going to be redundant and it will, all the rules of the work, uh, uh, submitted workers are going to be uh, replicated. So, what does that mean? So it's like uh, if you have some callbacks for, uh, and if you, with exec, with exec function, if you define a callback inside, and uh, sorry, with, uh, with uh, callbacks, you define a callbacks inside, and all the redundant children or children groups are going to have the same thing, same kind of uh, uh, callbacks. So basically we have here 
we are instantiating 10 workers that can that they can take TCP streams from a simple TCP server, compress them with the snappy, asynchronously, there is no for loop inside, there is nothing inside, this loop is just for the message uh, polling from the mailbox, this message, uh, message macro is basically polling the message from the uh, mailbox, and in the actor systems you might have heard that, that there is a mailbox, this is kind of a mailbox, and we are going to, I think, have a different macro that will help to put loop inside of it. And then basically have all these TCP streams compressed and write back asynchronously. And uh, that is all. And uh, if you don't know the message type, if you don't expect something, you just write, yeah, I don't expect something. Or I want to pay, uh, fail immediately in here. Or just write unreachable. So it's like... Um, and then, when there is a panic occurs in any place, you see that my arm wraps, I'm too lazy. So if for every single lazy person in this room, this is super good. I just write arm wrap. Oh, I don't care. <laughs> this is going to restart. This is going to restart. So when you arm wrap and there's an error over there, it's going to restart. It's not going to be like, oh yeah, you know, uh, I crashed. Uh, there's a panic over there. No, it's going to restart for every single day. If it's, it can't compress the thing, if it can't write back to the uh, port, it's going to uh, unwrap. This is how it is. So this is how the natural asynchrony should be. But the current implementations, I will say one more thing, to visualize how things are working. Stream pull next, direction of demand is upside down. Then stream map, then we map this thing. Then return none when it is exhausted. So why should I? Um, return none when it is exhausted. Should I say, I shouldn't I say something like, yeah, I am done and just cancel the upstream. This is how it should be, right? This is how the nature is. Like if uh, the, there's a uh, stream of things that is a um, stream of water that is coming down from the mountains, let's say. If we cut this uh, water from there, it isn't going to come late over there. So this is how it should be. Uh, come late over the bottom side of the mountain, for example. So this is how it should be. Uh, this is a problem in here that we don't ask for the demand. We just put, uh, demand actually drives us in these uh, implementations or outside right now in the Rust. So what we are suggesting and what we are doing in the Bastion and what we are currently working on is this. We have source, sync, that might remind you the reactive streams, Exactly, that is re reactive streams, and uh, the sync is going to demand the line back. So uh, sync is going to ask for ten elements. If there are ten uh, element uh, capability to process, and then the transform is going to transform these, uh, and ask uh, if there are things inside, and then ask back if there are no nothing to transform to the map, and the map asks back to the source, and basically. You don't need to uh, continuously pull from the source, and or the push. Any single push is going to make your make your system harder to uh, cope with the in-memory problems. So this is how the stream processing and the whole the future processing should work. And um, you can see these kind of example inside the Bastion. Uh, the example, uh, the middleware example is exactly like that. And there's also parallel computation example that is also doing the same thing basically. And uh, these are very, how can I say, it? Uh, very basic. You can do much more things, like many more things that, I mean, uh, meanwhile I'm writing the examples, I'm also too lazy. I was like, oh yeah, let's write something that is actually quite a bit easy. And uh, I wrote that, like that. But you can do some magical things with this, uh, improving over uh, the existing uh, examples. We have also showcase a repository that we can talk about we will talk about. So when it comes to the interoperability, so uh, the, this is a runtime. So it, uh, all these asynchronous operations are basically running on the executor, like async std or the Tokyo itself. OK, so um, how, uh, what we are basically, uh, what we can do, what we are doing. In the show case report, so there's only one example, but we can add more. So uh, you can see a uh, usage of Bastion with async std. So, um, uh, for example, in here, we are writing to a log file 
in a very simple way with every single request. And uh, we are just offloading all the I.O. operations to the async STD because we are not uh, made, so the bastion is not made for the I.O. operations. I didn't write a blocking pool or something like that. And I, actually, Stepan is actually very good at that. He just wrote it and everybody is using it. Why should I, why should I write it? I just want to need to write the management part. So this is the management part on top of the thing that is actually doing the I.O. Op uh, operation. And then we are uh, running side by side with async STD's uh, executor and the bastion, they are running perfect, there's no problem. And uh, all basic examples, um, uh, the examples inside uh, are, like I said, all, they're all basic, but you can see this uh, interoperation examples inside the uh, um, showcase repository, and uh, this uh, usage and the management are complete up to you. So, um, I'm finalizing a little bit, and uh, if you want to, how, uh, how you, if you are asking for the how you can learn about this and get involved, check out our code. Uh, you can uh, join to our Discord server, and uh, we have a uh, Discord server you can join, ask for questions. There are many things that needs to be worked on, but we are very less of people, and we have uh, a very good aim to do this thing uh, in a very, how can I say, concrete way of doing it. Um, and uh, we are very um, willing to uh, hear, hear from the people that are using this. And uh, check out our examples, check out our so showcase repo if you are interested in uh, what other things are, uh, uh, what other integrations are. And uh, one more thing that I want to add, this project has started in June 10, I think, and uh, I've deployed this to uh, DigitalOcean, and uh, and basically uh, what happened is uh, that this thing uh, was a Discord server. Uh, it, sorry, it was a Discord bot, and it was actually serving to the 250 people, which are all young teenagers that they are continuously removing their messages. And this was a test case, and we were just hating them because they are just removing their messages and not sending back, and they are writing sometimes uh, very bad things. So we just deployed this thing, and it is running since then, until today, and um, in there. And uh, there were a lot of panics were happening in there, but it was running, no single crash, and I didn't actually, I just wrote uh, no hub and the uh, project name. And it's running under the init, and it's just working. And I didn't write anything like the system D stuff. And this is basically how it is. Uh, thank you for listening to me. Uh, yeah. Any questions? Ah. Yeah. You, uh, so there is message passing between the workers? Yes, there, there, are, there are message passing between. Can you repeat the question? Huh? Can you repeat? Ah, uh, he is asking for the um, uh, uh, mess uh, are there any messages passing between the workers, right? Yes. Yeah. And um, yeah, there are messages passing between the workers, and we are using channels. And uh, these workers uh, can also communicate with each other. You can push uh, messages, broadcast messages, to all workers under a specific node in the supervision hierarchy that I show, ju just show. Um, basically, yeah, that is how it is. Well, Follow-up question, any plans to uh, make that work distributed? Yeah, I mean, uh, in the, <laughs> this is a good part. So this took a lot of time to make it like that. So we had put a small asterisk in the uh, GitHub in the distributed part and everybody else asking, this is not distributed. Right now we are working on something called artery artillery uh, that is actually going to do this uh, distributed part. So, uh, you know, maybe the Byzantine generals, I Im imagine the Byzantine generals can use the artillery to message pass. So it's going to use, we are going to write all these distributed uh, features inside of its yet another package that is going to do this for Bastion. So it's right now is not do, uh, doing that, but just uh, slam an uh, gRPC client over there, that is going to work. I think. Yeah. I uh, have to admit, I kind of got lost somewhere along the way, so maybe a silly question. But 
if you just sort of panic within a worker or something, then mm -hmm. whatever, you could like panic for a variety of reasons, of course, and then you do your error handling somewhere else. Yeah. I, how don't you need like more detailed information of what actually caused the error before you just like blindly restart? Or isn't there like at, at the very least, sure, you could like restart how it didn't work and then you go to failure or something, but isn't there like some information mm. being lost here in, in this sort of architecture? Um, recovery? Yeah, that is true. You might say that, yeah, uh, there will be information loss, but uh, all the errors are causing from a point that is actually uh, you are, what you are using from the create ecosystem or from the Rust itself. So all these features are, uh, all these uh, function, functions and all these elements are basically containing uh, some kind of information about it. If you want to add more, like in the first slide, let's go to uh, go back to this again. So here, uh, oh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, hit one more time. Oh, yeah. So, like in the my create DB error, for example, uh, you can add more things inside. So uh, it's up to you. I mean, if you want to add more things inside your error uh, handling code, it is okay. Um, but uh, I don't think that uh, you need more because all the panic information and all the panic hooks that is actually triggering is actually, when a panic hook triggers, is already gathering information about it. Actually, in, at least in the um, normal STD environment, it's like that. In the core environment, it's just doing the IRQ calls and then actually uh, trapping. And uh, this is not for the embedded, to be honest. So if it is going to be embedded, somebody need to help me to make it no SED, and I'm okay with that. Yeah. I hope I answered the question. <laughs> cool. More? <clears throat> what's, uh, what's something that you're excited to see rewritten or made with Um, <clears throat> Cool. Everything. Uh, <laughs> uh, I want to rewrite everything in Bastion. I really want to do that. But the most thi most uh, things, if you are if you are uh, if you heard things about the Erlang, and uh, probably all the Elixir developers out there are actually writing the first game servers and stuff like that. You can st if somebody wants to get into the action, they can write the game servers. This can um, one of our uh, developers in the um, Bastion um, site, uh, one of the core developers are actually using Bastion to write a streaming engine. And we are also writing some kind of things like that to actually use this, what I've told you, the natural asynchrony stuff. So um, basically um, we are doing these kind of things and that for data processing, it's going to be cool, I think. And um, there are um, plenty of things that uh, can be done and um, it's up to your imagination. But I think if you want to have a ground up stuff, uh, you can write a completely asynchronous um, web server that is opening a mapping to the old ports like the Erlang does. So, I mean, it is going to be really cool that they're showing that how many things that you can spawn. And actually all the scheduler inside of this thing is actually the rough replication of the Erlang scheduler. So it is using this uh, kind of, uh, High level things that the Erlang has done. So it's going to be nice to see something like this from my point of view. But it's up to you. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Too.